man. Talk about a one-two punch for communion and contribution, man. My, my Boricua brother there, Renel, and then Arturo. I mean, goodness gracious. It's like, a, how do you follow that act, you know? Uh, guys, thank you so much for your hearts for the cross. Thank you so much for your hearts for giving. Both of you are incredible examples of giving and of loving and of uh, really serving God's kingdom first and foremost. You know, and uh, I, I'm just really excited. We, we do so many incredible things in the kingdom of God here, you know. And uh, one of them is that we had this UUSL uh, Sports League that we, uh, that we had all year that was run by Chris Bradley and Mr. Noodles. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they had just an incredible time. And they, they baptized my brother, Michael Ajibola, amen? Yeah. So it was fruitful, so I'm excited about that. But today is the championship of championships. It's going to be basketball and lacrosse today. They play all the sports. Uh, and it's going to be at 9900 Guilford at Guilford Park. So 9900 Guilford 330, uh, which means our leaders meeting has been bumped up to 115. So leaders meeting will be right after service, uh, 115 to 215. And then Kathy will take the women at 215 to 315. And then at 315, we'll head on out to uh, the park. But I want to encourage everybody to go. It is going to be a blast. Take your visitors. Take your studies. Let them see the kingdom of God. Practice social distancing. Amen. But make sure you get on out there and encourage our athletes in the kingdom of God. We do have athletes in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Rocktoberfest 2020. Right. Rocktoberfest 2020. Please turn to Matthew 16. On, Matthew on, chapter 16. How do we have a Rocktober to remember? Well, first of all, we got to remember that the rock upon which we build our faith and our church is Jesus. Jesus is the only Messiah. He's the only rock, the son of the living God. That this is the message we must accept before we are baptized into Jesus Christ. That is the message we must accept as we pledge our allegiance as new citizens in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And in Matthew chapter 16, look at verse 13 with me. In verse 13, the Bible reads, Then Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they were like, well, some say you're, you're John the Baptist, and others say you're Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? What about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. That is the rock upon which we must build our church in the month of October. That is the rock upon which we must build the kingdom of God in November and December and throughout the rest of this crazy 2020 and on into 2021, and so on and so forth. You know, can, can our year of vision get any more dramatic than it has been? I mean, we always think, what's going to happen next? And holy smokes, the leader of the free world, perhaps the most insulated, personally secured, protected by a thousand gatekeepers or more, nobody who has not been tested or vetted or cavity searched, etc., can be within a hundred feet of this man. And he gets COVID-19. Along with his wife, Melania, and a dozen of his closest inner circle, the nucleus of the inner circle, the first lady, Senior White House advisor, Trump campaign manager, RNC ch chair, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, Senator Tom Tillis from North Carolina, Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin. Anyway, everybody knows every senator is a doggone multimillionaire. Former advisor Kellyanne Conway, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who helped him with his debate prep. And I'm like, wow. Supreme Court nominee oh, Amy Coney Barrett is still going up to committee. She didn't. She got tested. She was negative. But now even the whole process has come into question. Cam Newton got COVID. Cam Newton. The, the guy had two, taught us how to dab. Was that dab? We did that dab. Is that what they call it? You know, the rock. 
to this family, you know? This, this coronavirus doesn't care if you're black or white or Samoan, amen? You know, the second presidential bait may be held via Zoom. Probably so Trump can be muted <laughs> while Biden bloviates, right? You know, and it's getting crazier. The October surprise that they talk about in politics has already arrived, and it's only October the 4th. By the way, happy anniversary to my mother Leilani out there in Los Angeles. Uh, her and Big Lou would have been married 57 years today. Wow. Uh, there's no marriage in heaven, but it doesn't say there's no friendship in heaven. Uh, and my mom and my dad were best friends, you know, while they, while dad, my dad was here on earth before we went home to be with the Lord. So, you know, but my mom's going to be 78 in February, which blows my mind. So she's, she's, she's knocking on 80 years old, and she's still making disciples out in L.A., amen? You know, and, and it's just so amazing. When we think about heaven, you know, we're going to have our friends that are, you know, those that we love and those who decided to be true disciples of Jesus, you know, uh, and give their lives the way, you know, Arturo and the way Rennell described. You know, we, we give all our life. We give everything, you know. And, uh, you know, it's like, it'd be interesting. Who are you going to hang out with in heaven, right? You know, and who will who you avoid, right? No, you, you won't avoid anybody, I'm sure. But I know there are no cell phones in heaven, Amen. Because I don't want to sit and get kicked out when Herb Johnson calls me again, right? Amen. I <laughs> no, just kidding, Herb. Herb's my boy. You know? So in the midst of all this stuff that's going on, you know, how are we supposed to have an awesome Rocktober 2020? Point number one, you got to remember why you're alive. you got to remember why you are alive today. The end of, uh, this is the end of 49 A.D., the story I'm about to tell you, summer of 50 A.D. Paul is in Athens, Greece. It's the center of the short-lived Athenian Empire, world, uh, the, the, the center of the world for culture and wisdom and the latest ideas, you know, and, and Paul's not feeling too good about being in Athens right now. Let me explain. Look over in Acts chapter 17. Come on, bro. In Acts chapter 17. Come on, bro. Come on, Remember why you're alive. Especially for such a time as this. In Acts 17, verse 16, the Bible reads, Now while Paul was waiting for Silas and Timothy in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Do you ever get distressed when you see all the sin around you? The sin in your family. The sin in your household. The sin at your workplace. Do you see, you get distressed the way people seem to prioritize everything but God. You're not alone. And that's why you've got to pray. When you start feeling distressed, you have got to pray to your God. Excuse yourself, go wherever you need to go, but go pray and say, God, help me with this feeling in my heart of hearts. Verse 17. So Paul's distressed. In verse 17, so... He reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. You see, at this point, he didn't preach to them. He reasoned with them because that's what Greeks do. At least back in the day, they reasoned with each other. Tell me something. Are you preaching at people before you reason with them? Are you preaching at people before you even build a relationship with them? Are you banging them over the head with the Bible? Are you a Bible banger? Or a Bible reasoner? Do you know why Dr. Andrew Smelly is so effective down there in Johannesburg, South Africa? Because through apologetics, he reasons with people to make them see Christianity as true and reasonable. Because it is. Are you building trusting relationships with people? Are you reasoning with them before... Preaching to them. Verse 8. Verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, well, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So he opens with teaching and reasoning, and now he starts preaching. Amen? Does he preach fire and brimstone? No, not at all. He preaches love and good news. That's what Jesus is all about. 
That is what the gospel is all about. Verse 19, then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is as you're presenting? So you're bringing some strange ideas to our ears. You know, truly, the gospel seems strange to a lot of people around here. You know, they're like above it. They're like, uh, you know, oh, the, yeah, that, you're religious. You, you, you need that crutch. They don't understand. They, 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 it seems strange to them, the cross. It seems strange. You know, and we want to know what, what they mean, what these ideas mean. It says here, all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That sounds like a D.C. book club, amen? Before meetup. You know, and I have to admit, guys, sometimes, okay, get this, write this down. Sometimes training or being trained is simply watching what someone else does and imitating it. Watching what they do and doing what they do, especially if they're effective. If they're being effective and used by God. You know, I am so proud of, you know, uh, Chris and Oriana Bradley and, and Noodles and the UUSL Outreach. I mean, it, it, it was so awesome being out there being a ref, you know, uh, yesterday, you know. I was a terrible ref, but anyway, I had a great time watching them. <laughs> but, you know, like I said, once again, today's the two final games, basketball and lacrosse, and it's going to be incredible, 3.30 uh, p.m. And I want to encourage everybody to attend, okay? Uh, no extra meetings. Let's just go over there and take our friends and family and practice your social distancing, but get on out there. Let's get outside. It's a beautiful day. We've been locked up so much. Let's get out, you know. And like, once again, they've already baptized Michael Ajibola. How many more Michaels are out there? So many more. But we got to reach them. You know, and, and uh, have you been listening? Have you been imitating that? Doing something that you love to do and reaching people, you know? Are you imitating Kathy and I in our meetup outreach? You know, guys, you know, we've been fruitful several times since we've been here in D.C. with baptisms and place memberships and even restorations. You know, and if everybody just did, you know, what we did, my goodness gracious, guys, we're going to be at 200 disciples by the end of this year. That's going to be phenomenal. As much as the D.C. church has given to the world, I think we've sent out over 100 missionaries all over the world. You know, we're still at 130 people, 130 people. It's, it's, it's amazing what God continues to do. But, you know, if we all imitated each other's great ideas, believe me, we could be at 200 disciples by the end of this year. You know, what are you doing to make that happen? You know, sometimes training is just imitating what your leaders are doing and doing it. You know, have, have you done any meetups? You know? You know, through our now virtual book club, Kathy and I got nine people to this, the service in Virginia at the park. Nine people came on out. I'm glad they came out because they had to help us get the van out of the doggone mud. It was crazy. Anyway, that's a whole different story. But, you know, we, 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 we went out there and, and we had such a great time. And we even had some lunch. Practice our social distancing to the best of our ability. And nobody got sick. It's been two weeks. Nobody got sick. Amen. Yeah. We still got to be careful. Amen. Yeah. I think that's what happened. We got to be careful. Because I'm not insulated like the president is. I, you know, anyway, we got to be, we got to be safe. Verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are a bunch of wicked, idolatrous people. <laughs> Did he say that? No, he didn't say that. Paul was a brilliant. He was genius. He says, I can see that in every way you are very religious. He didn't say righteous. He said religious, okay? See, in America, we call that spiritual, right? With a lowercase s. So, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Can you imagine when Paul found that? He's like, awesome. I got it. <laughs> this, this is ours. This is the one. This is the one. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Now i got to tell them. He used what they had. Do you stay distressed when you see the sin in your, in your neighborhood, in your workplace? Or do you make the most of every opportunity? He says, now what you worship is something unknown. I am going to proclaim to you. Here it is. Here's the good news, guys. You know this statue over here? You don't know who it's for? I'm going to tell you who it's for. You know, the unknown God guy, that's my God. That's my God. You know, check this out. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. 
He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. You see, God did this. He determined the times when people would live and where they would live so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul even quotes their poets to relate to them. He quotes their poets. And they're like, I know that poet. I know that poem. Wow. It, 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 do you see what happens when we try to make ourselves relatable, when we try to be in the world but not of the world? Different thing. Okay? Are you familiar with our poets nowadays? Or if you don't like poetry, are you familiar with our writers? You know? Are you familiar with our American works of literature? Our diverse American culture? Are you familiar with those things? Are you involved in the community? To the extent possible, now that we're in this COVID era, but to the extent it possible, are you getting out there somewhat to let them see your light, to let them see what you have in common with them so they can see to an unknown God who that's all about? You see, Paul finds commonality. That is what we have to do. Do you think Chris Bradley and Noodles like sports just because they like sports? Or do they like sports? You know, they, they like sports. God made them that way. They like sports because God was going to use them and their love for sports to reach people like Michael Ajibola. That's what God did. This is what God always does with people who are, are His. You know, do you think I love books just because I like to read? Or was God going to use my love for books and reading to bring me to Washington, D.C. to meet, you know, all my new friends? I got so many new friends in D.C. that I reach out to all the time. A lot of them that came to church. A lot of them that study the Bible, that are studying the Bible. Guys, God uses our inclinations, our proclivities, the things that we like. He uses these things to reach other people. Amen. Are you taking advantage of those opportunities? Do you think God gave me uh, you know, a love for my high school uh, just because I love Neff High School in La Mirada and, and, you know, and this love for Neff High Trojans? That's our high school name? No. God was going to use my love for my high school, my alma mater, my Neff High Trojans in La Mirada, so I could start a Facebook page that would reach Gail Wilson, who then sent her son Chad Wilson, who had a job in uh, D.C. He says, you've got to go meet a friend of mine who went to my same high school. Chad comes over. We, I get to know him. I introduce him to Ben and Jeff. They study the Bible with them. They baptize Chad into Christ. I mean, this is amazing what God does with the different things that we, we, we do and the different proclivities that we have. You know, and now Chad is reaching hundreds of people through helping us with our cyber team, which is amazing. As a matter of fact, it's not just that. He's down in Thomasville right now at their inaugural service with Sterling to encourage Joe Garman and Edie Garman who are having their very first service down there in Thomasville, Georgia, uh, the Thomasville Tallahassee Church. Is that amazing? This is what God does. It, it, it was a little, little Facebook group I started. You know, it, 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 it's so... Um, what are we doing to be creative to reach as many as possible, people? You see, God has brought all of us to the DMV right now, to Delaware, to North Carolina for such a time as this. That's why He's brought you here. You know, are you making the most of your opportunities. You know, God brought a couple sisters from LA to be with us today, right here, and that's Bernicia and Lexus from the Southland in the City of Angels Church, and I know he brought them here for a reason. I'm not trying to steal them now. Don't, 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 don't be, you know, I'm not trying to steal them like that. I'm just saying there's probably going to be somebody they meet here who could study the Bible and become disciples. Wherever God sends disciples, that's what we do. That's how we roll. This is, this is who we are in Jesus Christ, you know? We get that phrase, for such a time as this, from the book of Esther. Look over in uh, Esther right now, Esther chapter 4. Give you the background. 
people of God are threatened with extinction by the evil Haman. Haman persuades King Xerxes from 300 favor. Remember those King Xerxes, right? To wipe out the Jews, Mordecai uncovers the plot, tells Queen Esther, who is a Jew, but no one really knows this, and she's like, you know, uh, the king hasn't summoned me, Uncle Mordecai. Uh, if I go to him without being summoned, I could very well lose my life. What you're asking me to do is a bit much, Uncle Mordecai. You know? And then over in Esther chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. Come on, bro. <laughs> this, is, this is called a rebuke right here, guys. In verse 13. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. I love Mordecai's confidence. You know, sometimes I wish my name was Mordecai. Amen, guys. Yeah. Mordecai Martinez. You like? I like that. Anyway. Anyway. She said, but then he says, but you, you, Esther, and your father's family will perish. Esther, we are being threatened with annihilation. But our God will deliver us. And here's how you can help. But if you're not willing to help because you're fearful, God will deliver us by some other means. That was his faith. But it will not go well for you if you remain silent. Is, has this coronavirus got you silent? Has the economic shutdown got you silent? Or are you sharing your faith with more people than ever before? Because let me tell you, there are people that we're reaching that we never reached before. Because people all over the United States are sending us people to study the Bible because of this lockdown, because of what's going on, you know? I mean, it, you know, it's amazing. My dad barely knew the Bible when we were growing up, but he always used to tell me, God hates a coward, Lou Jack. God hates a coward. You know, Revelation 21, verse 8, you know? And that's what he was laying out for, more, for, you know, for Esther here, Mordecai was, you know? And then he, and then he encourages her. He, then he encourages her, he inspires her. You got you to encourage and inspire too, amen? Yeah. Not just rebuke. But he goes, and who knows, Esther, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Amen. And because of her courage, Esther got her book in the Bible, Amen. One of the few books named after a woman. Amen? Amen. Point number two. God will use you or someone else. Yes. Will you get your name in the next Bible? Can you imagine? The book of Catherine. The book of Danielle. The book of Dr. Janet. The book of Lexus. The book of Bernicia. The book of Ruth. Hey, that is a book. Hey, we got the book of Ruth, amen? You see what I'm saying, guys? How awesome. But are you remaining silent at this time? Or are you asking the hard questions of your family and friends at this time? This is an opportunity. You know, the, the, the real question is like, Mom, how are you really doing? Dad, how's your marriage really going? How lonely are you really feeling right now, friend? How's your mental health? How is your emotional health? People think, oh, this is a private business. Let me tell you something. Because people don't talk about how they're doing emotionally or mentally, they get into so much pr trouble and problems. I praise God for Cassell Spence starting that perfect weakness ministry for brothers and sisters who need this help. And some of us need this help that don't even admit it to ourselves. Right. We gotta start getting open about where we're really at and say, you know what, I need to talk to somebody. I praise God, you know, for, for, for him. And, and to think about what Cassell's done. Cassell's given his life to the kingdom of God. He's poured his life out. He, he, he's building, helping us build a kingdom here. He's truly delighting himself in the Lord. And what did God just do? He gave Cassell the desire of his heart. And Deontay said yes when he asked her to marry him. Amen. I mean, this is amazing, guys. When you, when you, when you really think about it, it's like, wow, you know. Uh, God, God, God wants to do such amazing things if we would just delight ourselves in Him. How's your Women's Day follow-up going, sisters? Have you challenged those who said they would come but did not show up and just called them to be women of their word? Have you set up that Bible study that you said you were going to set up? Have you gotten your visitors out to Sunday? Did you make it happen? Are you a make-it-happen person for God? Or are you too involved in your own tri trials and, 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 and problems. 
You know, I, I definitely want to hold up my boy Sterling Silver, you know. I got a message from a brother in Chicago named Tony Natoli. And Tony uh, hooked me up with a guy named McKean who lives in Maryland here. And he's a single professional with a bachelor's degree in animal science and a master's in biotech. This guy's a smart guy, okay. I said, Sterling, can you get in there? Can you get this guy studying and get some of the Maryland guys involved, you know. And, and, and by the way, Ken Chin, who leads the uh, house church in Maryland, just allowed Sterling to come and help us in D.C. So I praise God for my brother Ken being a team player you know because uh, Isaiah needed some help in DC but that's what we do and that's why we've gone to house churches instead of regions we, we're gonna still hold on to this because we're gonna get back here amen and I like this thing anyway so uh, but you know but they start cranking through the studies already Sterling's already studying the Bible with the king and the king's so fired up you know and, and like Esther Sterling made it happen you know sacrificing his time and his energy to make this study happen and and once again here's the here's the kicker he wasn't even in town <laughs> He wasn't even in town. He made it happen on the road as him and Chatter down, like I was saying earlier, in Thomasville, encouraging the brothers and sisters there in Thomasville, Georgia. This is incredible. I love that, brother. That is so, are you a make it happen person? Because a lot of people to talk. A lot of people to talk to talk. But to walk the walk, those are the difference makers. Those are the, are, 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 are the change makers. Those are the rain makers. Are you a rain maker for the kingdom of God? You know, I've heard people say, you know, uh, your life uh, may be the only gospel your friends ever read, or you may be the only hope for your family and friends or neighborhood. You know, I just don't think God's that shallow. Because Mordecai made it very clear. God wants to use you, Esther, but if he can't use you, he will use somebody else. Don't be, don't, don't, don't be the person that loses that opportunity. Let yourself be used by Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Point number three. Kingdom. God and the kingdom come first. You know, uh, this amazing uh, paper that was written by this brother about, uh, you know, God's kingdom and, and, and about really uh, putting, putting God's kingdom first. And it blew my mind because he basically reasoned from the scriptures about why he had to put God before his own family. He said, if, 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 if I love my family like I claim to love them, I have to put God first. Because if I, put, if I put my family first, then they become Lord. Then they're the ones that influence me the most. Then they're the ones that direct my path. But if I put God first, then God is the one that directs me. God is the one that guides me. God is the one that leads me the way. My family didn't save me. My God did. Amen. So if I want my family to be saved, I'm going to have to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Amen. Not just my dad. Not just my mom. But, but Jesus himself. I've got to put God first. The fact of the matter is, sometimes our mom and dads are wrong. Mm -hmm. I know my mom and dad, as much as they loved me and, and, and cared for me, and they were, they were so good to me. I, I lived such a fairy tale life in so many ways growing up in, in Southern California. But my mom and dad were not disciples. They believed in Jesus, but they had no idea what, who he was, what that meant to be a disciple. And, 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 and so I had to take the gospel to them, even though they were so disappointed in me. They were like, we didn't send you to Harvard so you can come back a preacher. <laughs> That's a lot of money to be a preacher. You know, but I had to stick to my guns because I knew what was right. And I had to love Jesus more and let Jesus influence me more than my mom and my dad. And when we planted the church in 1989, I reached out to my mom. And I knew I'd get mom because mom loves the word of God. And she becomes, a, she becomes a disciple. And on the day of her baptism, she asked my, my dad, are you going to come to my baptism? He goes, no, I'm not coming to your baptism. And by the way, when you, when you get back, I'll be gone. That's what he told my mom. My mom was brokenhearted. But she wept and she went to the ocean to be baptized. Come on, mama. And praise God, she got baptized, and she got home, and Dad was still there. Amen? <laughs> and a woman of perseverance, she persevered for 17 years with that old man. And on January the 15th, 2006, Big Lou was baptized into Christ. And, and, and the amazing thing about it is that two years later, on July 3rd, 2008, he died. He was gone. I, we didn't know. 
we, he had diabetes, but 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 he uh, he had, had a cardiac arrest, and and uh, as a complication of that, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And I mean, just it blows my mind how merciful, like my brother said, merciful. How merciful our God is, because He saved my dad before my dad passed away. But you know, it's because me and my mom, we sought first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and God took care of the rest. Are you doing that? Are you stepping out in faith like that? Because if you want those you claim to love, if you want them to be saved, you've got to seek first God's kingdom and His righteousness. You've got to love Jesus more than you love your own family. It's not easy. But Jesus himself said it too. He says, like, who, who, who are my, my brother uh, you know, and my mother? And he points to the disciples. That's who were. And those were the ones that turned the world upside down. Amen? Amen. And, uh, you know, just to let you know, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. You know, I, I'm very practical. Uh, if something works, I stick with it. It just makes sense, you know, uh, especially if that something saves lives and saves souls. You know, our first principle study series has come under fire from some folks. Uh, and they say, well, it's just a cookie cutter way to, 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 to make these so supposed disciples, you know. And, and I told this, this brother, I said, no, I said, it, it, it's not that at all. Because my mom and dad aren't cookies. They're people. First principles, you know, it, it, it's the way I and my family were introduced to the scriptures. Because I had no idea where to start in the Bible. I, how many, you know how many times I started in Genesis? And stopped in Numbers? <laughs> you know, it, its first principle is the way I got cut to the heart. When I realized from the scriptures, not the booklet, the scriptures, what my sin did to Jesus on the cross. First principles is how I learned about what sin is. You know, it, first principles pointed me to the scriptures that I needed. To understand you know, the gravity of my sin and the love that God has for me. I didn't know where to go. Most people don't. Yeah. Most Americans don't even know where to start in the Bible to learn how to have a relationship with God. That's why first principles is so incredibly important. Preach. And it saved me, and it saved my mom, and it saved my dad, and it saved my brothers, and it's my brother, and it saved my sisters. Why would I change it? It's working. It's been working since it was put together in 7980. But not because of the booklet. Because of the scriptures. Because of the word of God. Amen? Amen. Exactly. First principles doesn't save us. It points us to the scriptures that can. First Corinthians chapter 11. In First Corinthians chapter 11, beginning of verse 17, the Bible reads, First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. In the following directives, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. There are some very dead churches. There are some very doctrinally incorrect churches. There are some very talented churches with great music that are completely void of basic Bible teaching. God forbid we, the D.C. church, ever becomes one of those. Verse 18, in the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. A lot of people don't like to read that scripture. Because they know the condition of their church shows them where they're really at. But so they can change because God loves them. Amen? Amen. So they can change and repent because God loves them. People hate when it's pointed out because the truth hurts. Do you know who I'm going to go to to help me you know, convert my adult children? You know, for Christ, those who've converted their adult children. Because I failed in this as a young father. Do you know who I'm going to go to to uh, uh, ask about losing weight and trying to keep it off? Those who've lost weight and kept it off. Because I'm 56 years old now and it's a lot tougher. Do you know who I'm going to ask about sharing their faith? Those who bring visitors to church frequently. Do you know who I'm going to ask about making disciples? Those who are constantly in the baptistry, baptizing them. 
That's who I'm going to ask. Do you know who I'm going to ask about how to build a church or a campus or a singles or a married ministry? Those who built churches and ministries all over the world. We're almost 8,000 strong now, guys. Began this movement in 1979. To this day, we still make disciples the same way because it works. We find these people and these churches in the Bible, but you know, we're reading about for you know the first century. How does this translate effectively today? You know, we got to find out who's making the books ha- book of Acts happen in 2020. Amen? Amen. And I hope you're getting a whole lot of our Good News Network uh, a video. Amen. I don't know they call it. Do they call it video anymore? The YouTube channel, you know, it's amazing what God is doing all over the world. You know, I've been all over the world. I've seen nothing like we have in the kingdom of God here in D.C. I've seen nothing like the ICC world, nothing like it. Nothing. And I, I believe me, I've looked. I've searched. And there's nothing like what we have here. In the kingdom of God, using first principles, whether it's in Chennai, India, or New Delhi, or Washington, D.C., or New York City, or L.A., nothing like we have, guys. I hope and I pray you are as grateful for the elementary teachings of the Bible as I am, as Kathy is, because we are so incredibly grateful to our God. I want to read this conversion story for you. I grew up in the church. I remember as a child how my parents would cry out to God as they prayed. They would pour out their hearts to God without shame. I grew to desire the same passion for God myself. One day during a prayer service, a time when adults came together to pray to God and worship Him with songs, I stopped playing with my friends and watched as my mother sang so beautifully to God. I must have been about six or seven years old. My parents had taught me how to pray, and in that moment, watching my mother, I prayed, God, please help me to feel what she feels. At that moment, I felt something come over me that I cannot explain to this day, and I began to cry. Since that time, I have felt a deep emotional connection to God. I believe God answered the prayers of a little girl with a pure heart. Later in my teens, I felt a desire to know God in a deeper way, as with most of my friends at the time. I was no angel. I did very well in school, achieving straight A's and becoming valedictorian of my high school. I was also class president every year of high school. I joined as the band as a dancer and was part of the junior ROTC and and lots of other groups. On the outside, I was perfect. On the inside, I was an emotional wreck. My teens were smeared with, uh, teen years were smeared with impurity that then turned into immorality. In fact, during my sophomore year of high school, my mother sat me down and told me words I will never forget. She said, I am disappointed in you. Her words sank into my heart, and and I knew I needed to change for my mother. She saw through the scholastic perfection, she saw through the scholastic perfection into my heart. And since I had grown up in the church, I thought to myself, I need to turn back to God. I I made a decision to repent for my sins, and I asked my church pastors, my aunt and my uncle, if I could be baptized. They said yes, and later that summer I cried out to God, broke up with my first real boyfriend, apologized to anyone I could uh, recall I ever heard, and I got baptized. I also began reading my Bible daily and attending every church service I could. Looking back, I'm glad I made that decision, but now I know that I was missing something. I was missing the knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I also realized that the teachings of the church I was brought up in did not align with Jesus' foundational teachings about the church, church or the heart of a true Christian. So, unfortunately, at 15, I wasn't raised to a new life. But I'll never forget how it felt to make a commitment to God at such a young age. And unfortunately, the zeal I had for God quickly faded. How many of us can relate to that after a religious experience, right? I soon had another boyfriend and delved deeper into impurity and eventually immorality. My boyfriend became my idol. If there was any advice I could give my younger self, it would be to slow down, sister. I would tell myself to enjoy each moment and to keep my childhood innocence for as long as possible. Amen to that. I, I, I do the same thing. I have a niece now who is 12 years old, and this is my daily prayer for her, that she will take uh, and live each day, not looking too far behind or too far ahead, that she will never know the shame that comes with immorality. 
The Bible says in Matthew 6, 33 to 34, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I've cried out to God many more times since I was 15. Fast forward into graduate school, I was again in a dark place spiritually. This always happens to everybody who doesn't have disciples in their life. It always does. I just moved to a new city far away from home and I decided that I needed to find a church. I began attending a Baptist church nearby and reading the Bible again. I decided to get to know the younger singles in my, my new church and so I joined the young adult choir and went to Bible study for young adults each week. I thought, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. However, I was still held captive to my sins. I tried to find a mentor in the church to help me with my life and to help me search for Bible answers. This proved to be very difficult. In a church over thousands of members, I could not find one person who would help me. Wow. Come on, Ron. Autonomous churches make autonomous disciples. After months of prayer for help, I realized that my boyfriend at the time was studying the Bible with a group of guys. I asked him to give my number to his group of friends because I was interested in studying the Bible, too. He did, and I met with some of the women from this Bible study group. When I met with these women, they looked familiar. I, in fact, I, I, they had been inviting me to a group Bible discussion for months, and I had always said no to them. Religious people always say no. As a busy graduate student pursuing a master's degree in development economics, I did not want to spend my time with just talking about the Bible. Okay, so she wasn't just religious, she was very busy too, but I wanted to study it out and learn to live it out. She didn't want something superficial, she wanted something real. I didn't understand at the time that this is what these women had been inviting me to do. Thankfully, God was patient and merciful with me. When I met with the women, we studied out things like what it means to seek God wholeheartedly, what it means to make the Bible the standard for your life, and what it means to live a life with the heart and daily actions of Jesus. I learned that Jesus died so that I could turn away from my sin and instead turn to God. It's like you don't just lock yourself in a closet. You turn away from sin, but you turn toward God. You fill your life up with good things. She realized this. Because of the shame of looking foolish, I didn't tell the women that I was confused about the resurrection of Jesus until over a year later after meeting them. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 3, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Once I finally humbled myself and told my close friends about my confusion, they were willing to help me with open arms. I was then able to make a decision with my whole heart to surrender to God, follow Jesus, and I was baptized. I learned that I could put the past behind me, including my religious past, and be raised to a new life. That is what happened on February 10th, 2013. God showed me mercy by not holding against me the sins I had committed against Him, even as a believer. And then He showed me grace by giving me more than I could have ever imagined. Today, I am filled with an inexpressible joy. 1 Peter 1 to 8. And I had the opportunity to have a pure dating relationship with an amazing Christian man, and we now have a pure marriage, relying on God's Holy Spirit power that we first gained through baptism, Acts 2, 38. Most importantly, I have a shameless relationship with God. He restored my innocence and my childlike heart. And now I look forward to the day when I can share my story with my future children to show them that they can take their time growing up and take each day, one day at a time, your sister, Jasmine Okiaman. Come on, Jasmine. It is easy to be religious. That is why so many people are. Religion is on your terms, but not true Christianity. True Christianity is on Jesus' terms. Do you know what Jesus' terms are? Today, I'm going to ask you to talk to the person who invited you out to ask them, what are Jesus' terms? What does he say a true Christian is? Point number four, and I'll close with this. Remember, true Christianity is is all in or you're all out true Christianity is all in or you'll be left out in Luke chapter 14 verse 25 I want you to write that down and I want you to read it uh, you know uh, after a church day but but please 
If you're visiting with us, please talk to the person uh, who brought you and ask them, please study the Bible with me. I, 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 I learned some new teachings here today. I learned something new. I, I want to know more. Uh, if you go to dcicc.net, uh, you can get a free Bible. We can hook you guys up with a free Bible. So dcicc.net, that's also where you can give uh, your uh, contribution if you haven't already done so. Uh, but dcicc.net, you can get a free Bible and you can set up a Bible study. We will be there for you because we want you to know and have what we know and what we have. How are we going to have a rocking Oktoberfest 2020? Point number one, remember why you're alive. Christian, you're here to bring glory to God and faith, hope, and love to a lost world. Point number two, remember God wants to use you and give your life real meaning, but he can and will use someone else if you're not willing. Point number three, remember we must seek first God's kingdom and is doing what is right. Then and only then will we get everything we need and find true and lasting happiness. And point number four, remember true Christianity is all in Christianity. It's not churchianity. Amen. And just to help us to remember what God has done in our lives and in this church, our awesome uh, young blood brother, uh, David Fisher, worked his magic with an amazing slideshow that we're going to see right now. If you're visiting with us today, tell the person who invited you, you know, what you learned today, uh, what your takeaway from today was, what resonated with you today. God has a plan for you that is immeasurably more than anything you could ask for or imagine. I love you all with the love of the Lord and to Almighty God be the glory. Thanks so much.